Okay. Thank you all so much for attending this program tonight. Uh, this is Clues from the Cemeteries. This will be researching um, and how researching at a cemetery can lead you to find your family and your ancestors. My name is Sarah. I am a librarian um, with the genealogy team here at Haggard Library. Um, we also have Sabrina here in the chat. If y'all have any questions as we're going through this presentation tonight, go ahead and put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I will stop along the way a couple of times and uh, ask uh, Sabrina if we had any questions and she will help relay those to me, or she might just be able to answer you in the chat. Uh, she'll also provide some links for some stuff when we talk about that. Um, this class is being recorded and when, uh, we are finished. It will be posted onto the Plano Public Library YouTube page uh, later on. So if there's something you really found interesting or you want to show it to family members later, you should be able to do that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So our class objectives tonight. This class is just a basic introduction to using cemeteries in your genealogical research. Skills we're going to kind of touch on tonight. First, we'll talk about some basic tips on how to research and locate uh, cemeteries that your ancestors might be buried in. Then we're going to talk about some basic types of cemeteries, headstones, headstone markers, and what they mean. And then lastly, we'll go over some tips for visiting cemeteries and what information you should gather while you were there. So the very first thing we have to do is locate these cemeteries where your ancestors are buried. How do we do that? The most obvious places to start are going to be things like death certificates, obituaries, um, death notices, death registers, funeral cards, or programs from funeral homes if they have an archive of their things. There's all sorts of different records and sources that might lead you to the cemetery where your ancestor is. Um, those are the obvious ones, but then there are things like um, oral histories, where somebody just might mention in passing, like, oh, I remember when the town was built and they built the cemetery, or talk about some funerals that they went to at them. Uh, that is also what local libraries and genealogical or historical societies might be able to provide. Um, maybe if there's like a letter or a diary where somebody wrote about somebody's funeral that might provide information. Same thing, autopsy records or Bible records. If you're um, an old pro doing genealogy research, you know sometimes the only um, record of a marriage is in the back of a Bible. Same is true for um, funerals and, or burials. Might have just been written in the family Bible where um, that ancestor was buried. Then there are some more specific things, um, burial permits, coroner's records, uh, things like death set C, there are lists kept of that. So if you know your ancestor uh, was a fisherman or was possibly in the Navy, um, you might try and search some one of those indexes. Uh, Social Security death index, wills, administrations, probates, somebody could have it specified in their will that I already own a plot at this cemetery or my last wishes are to be cremated and then have the ashes stored at this place. Sometimes those will provide the details that you're looking for. Or if they were um, possibly like military or part of a, uh, a historical event, there might be a monument that has their name on them and uh, monument makers records are kept as well. So an example of this, is, this is a death certificate from Texas that does include some burial information. You can see it circled at the bottom right corner um, of the image. This can include place of burial or removal, the date of the burial, who the undertaker was, and the address of the cemetery. Um, this can change depending on the state or even what year um, that the record comes from. I've seen other death certificates from Texas that have the information in a different spot or it's labeled a little bit differently. So sometimes you do just have to kind of read them and see what's there. 
Um, you can see this one doesn't have like a specific cemetery name. It is just the cemetery that is in Avery, Texas. Uh, I did Google it, there is only one. Um, and so you can, at least this gives a place where you can go and start looking for this ancestor. Um, but death certificates might also include other useful or interesting information about your ancestor, such as their name of their parents, the birthplace of their parents, or um, cause of death. It's interesting. You can see this person uh, was 76 years old and cause of death was stated as senility. So interesting what we can learn from these sort of documents. Any questions so far? Uh, nope, nothing about this so far. All right, pretty straightforward. So if you're lucky enough to find uh, these sort of documents or uh, records about your ancestor and get a cemetery off the bat, that's awesome. However, that's not gonna happen with all of your ancestors. So you may have to explore all of the cemeteries in the county or area where your ancestor died sometimes to be able to figure out where they are buried. This is when you hope that some historical society or genealogical group has walked the cemeteries in the area and created a list of everyone buried in them. And you also hope that all of the headstones are still standing or still legible. Um, so there are some books and guides such as the Cemeteries of the U.S. Uh, that is a national guide for contact information for some U.S. cemeteries and their records. There are also some statewide or county guides if you know specifically like what county your ancestor lived in. Sometimes city directories or like phone books will have um, addresses for the cemeteries. County, local, or family histories, again, diaries or letters, all might provide information um, about who might have been buried there, where the cemeteries were, when things uh, occurred. Cemetery deeds, so for if it was a private cemetery or a cemetery owned maybe like by an organization, you can see when that was started. Uh, if your ancestor died before the cemetery was started, you know it's probably more likely that they weren't buried there. You can find clues like that. Um, and then, of course, things like maps or transcriptions of the individual cemeteries, if they're out there. Um, church graveyards or family burial grounds will typically keep pretty good records about who is buried in their, um, in their area, in their cemeteries. Um, sometimes cemeteries are relocated or some of them are defunct and people aren't really caring for them or more people are not being buried in them. So you might know that the cemetery is there, but there might not be a lot of information. Veteran cemeteries, there are also online lists or sections records from um, funeral homes or from like the caretakers of the cemeteries. There's all sorts of different records that you can look at help hopefully find some sort of clue about your ancestor. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, on the left, we have the cemeteries of Collin County, Texas. So this is just a small book we, that we do have in the genealogy center here at the Hagrid Library uh, that lists out the different cemeteries that we have in Collin County, whether they're defunct or not. Um, I might have some of the indexes of people who are buried there, but I, I don't guarantee that. Um, we also, on the right is an example of a diary that we have in our archives here. These, the Genealogy Center has a few of the diaries from the early days of Plano and Collin County, and some do mention cemeteries and those who were first buried in them. And like I was saying earlier with the family um, Bibles, that this may be the only proof you will find for people buried in those cemeteries. So, for example, this one is kind of hard to read, but I do have the transcription. So, this is from the Thomas Finley Houston Diary. It says, Sunday, January 5th, 1902. Weather clear, still day, but cold. Thin ice, 30 degrees above. Funeral of Bo Nelson at the Baptist Church by W.G. McCall. Burial at Oddfellows Cemetery at 1 p.m. So, that might be the only... Uh, proof that we have that this Bo Nelson person, uh, where they were buried. 
And we know when as well, uh, since it was in his daily diary. So, and then these are an example of cemetery maps. So on the left, again, this is one that we have, this is actually hanging on the wall in the genealogy center. It's the Collin County Cemetery Locator, as does, they're hard to see on this picture, um, but if you look, see some of the yellow spots all around the map, those are the cemeteries of Collin County. And then if you are lucky, sometimes the individual cemeteries themselves have already been mapped out and indexed. So uh, this is the Young Cemetery. You can see um, all of the gravestones are numbered and plotted out onto the map. And then on the right, we have the index of actually whose graves those all are. So if you were just flipping through the maps and you saw um, your ancestor's name, you might know you're on the right track. Or if you don't see their name, uh, you know, to look someplace else. So those are very, very handy if uh, the cemetery you're looking at happens to have one. And you can always search um, the catalog uh, online to see everything we have in the genealogy center is there. So if you do a quick search of like cemetery maps or cemeteries, it should show you what we have. Uh, any other questions still making sense so far? Yep, no questions yet. Awesome. Okay, online databases. So because we do live in the modern day and age, fortunately, a lot of this information has been put all online. Not all of it. You still might have to go out in the trenches and walk some cemeteries yourself. But um, websites like Find a Grave or Billion Graves uh, have started kind of collecting the information about all of these different cemeteries. Uh, US GenWeb, if you are familiar with them from all of your genealogy research, um, they have their um, tombstone transcription project, which I will talk about more later. Um, but they also just have a general tombstones page where they encourage people to join and add pictures to their collection, kind of like crowdsourcing um, all the different cemeteries in the US. There is the gravestone pho photographic resource, which is mostly English countries, um, but you don't know what fun hidden gem you might find there. Deathindexes.com is an index to websites that have death indexes and they're listed out by state and county. So maybe you can find your ancestors. Oh, Sarah? Yes. Sorry, uh, part of your last sentence just cut out. Would you mind repeating it? Sure. Uh, so the Death Indexes uh, website is an index to websites of different death indexes listed by state or county. So if um, you have a general idea of where your ancestor might have died. You can go there, see if the um, death indexes are available and whether you might be able to find death certificates or not. U.S. Funeral Homes Online and U.S. Funerals Online are both comprehensive directories of the funeral homes across the United States. And then there's places like American Battle Monuments Commission, um, or the Arlington National Cemetery, big famous ones where you might be able to find more information on your ancestors or some other national cemeteries. The uh, Association for Gravestone Studies uh, gives more information about the study and preservation of gravestones. And the other sites like legacy.com, dignity memorial or tributes.com will often have pages where people will include um, photos of the deceased, obituaries, and occasionally if they are out there, photos of their gravestone. So you might be able to find more information about your ancestors there. Uh, we do have a question on the online resources. Sure, um, let's go back one page. What's the question? Uh, it was, um, how many of these are free to search? I believe most of them are. Find a Grave is free. Billion Graves, I believe, is free as well. Legacy is free to search sometimes, like if you want to add, read the, some of the comments that people have left on it or different things like that. I think you have to have an account, but GenWeb's free. I was playing around on the Gravestone Photographic Resource. That's all free. I believe most of them are. 
right, any other questions? Uh, nope, that was the only one. All right. Okay, so you've done your research. You found some information about your ancestor and where they might be buried. Now let's talk about the different types of cemeteries that are out there and the different sort of grave markers. So I'm sure you've heard all of these different terminologies for a cemetery. Um, they all do actually have different and specific meanings to them. So first is a church graveyard. If you find a cemetery that is called a graveyard, that is primarily a burial ground within a churchyard specifically. Um, so this photo on the right um, is the Big Springs Cemetery on Jupiter Road in Garland. It is attached, it is right next to um, a church right there. So that is considered a graveyard. Uh, but this is like a square rectangle thing. Not every cemetery is a graveyard, but every graveyard is a cemetery. Um, so just remember graveyards have to be attached to a church. Public or municipal cemeteries are ones that are available for use by the general public. There are really no restrictions on who is allowed to buy um, a plot and be buried uh, in those cemeteries. Oftentimes they are ran by municipalities. Some can be run by corporate entities, but still be public. Um, for example, like if a funeral home also runs a graveyard, um, that can be considered a public cemetery. One thing about traditional or um, public or municipal cemeteries is traditional ones are going to have upright headstones or memorials. So like the ones you see in the Big Springs picture that are above the ground, your traditional um, headstone, that's gonna be in your normal public cemetery. Garden or rural cemeteries um, are a type of public or municipal cemetery, but they were often built outside of the city limits by about one to five miles with a landscaped park-like setting. So that maybe the town didn't have enough space for the cemetery or they just wanted to have it to have more land. So they would build it outside of the town just a little bit. Then we come to private cemeteries. So you have public and you have private ones. Uh, so a private cemetery, the plots are typically reserved and not sold to the general public. So your most common type of private cemetery is going to be a family cemetery. So for example, Elvis Presley and several members of his family, including his mother, his father, his daughter, Lisa Marie, and her son um, are all buried at Graceland. Um, therefore, even though it's still a museum and a tour um, entertainment venue, I guess, uh, tourist attraction, it is also technically considered a private cemetery. Again, so the general public cannot be buried there, but members of the Presley family um, are buried there. A memorial park uh, is Typically, they can be private or public, but what makes them different from other cemeteries is that they feature only lawn level memorials in order to make the cemetery look and feel like a garden or a park. So the typical, like we were talking about the headstones that come above the ground, um, you see their big profile, you would not have those in a memorial park. Typically, it will be just like a plaque or something that is um, just on the ground, on, on level. Military and veteran cemeteries are typically run by the Department of Veterans Affairs, or in some cases by state associations that are VA grant funded. They are uh, available for use by military members and their immediate families. So here in Texas, we have um, National Veteran Cemeteries in Dallas, Houston, El Paso, Kerrville, and San Antonio, who actually has two national cemeteries. Um, so it's a big military uh, city. 
in San Antonio. So they have two down there. And then there's a handful of um, state run, uh, state fund, VA funded um, cemeteries around as well. Fraternal and lodge cemeteries are cemeteries that are owned and operated by a fraternal organization or lodge with sale of plots typically reserved for members of that organization and their immediate families only. Um, I have a list of some of the ones later, but you can think of like the Elks or um, the Odd Fellows. Those are going to be some fraternal organizations. Uh, Denton has a, it's the IOOF Cemetery. It's the International Order of Odd Fellows Cemetery. Slave burying grounds, um, because enslaved persons were treated much differently like than the rest of the population, unfortunately, um, they have their own burying grounds that are often unmarked or mass graves. So it is very hard to determine where specific individuals are buried. If you are um, researching ancestors that used to be enslaved persons, sometimes you're going to have to use a lot of context clues. Um, again, like if you know if where they were located or if like they were at a specific city or plantation, then you might look and see what's in that area. There have been efforts recently taken over the past 30 and 40 years to find and document these locations with the geological surveys and scans so they can kind of tell. Um, I was looking at ones for like Monticello or in George Washington's estates um, where they think the slave burying grounds were and they can kind of figure out where some of the graves were but determining who is actually in them is next to impossible. One thing you can do is um, old maps will sometimes hold clues to some of these cemetery locations. Uh, we do have History Geo as a database um, that has uh, information and old maps of different areas. So sometimes you can look at that and possibly find some context clues for where a cemetery um, would have been. And lastly, we have a potter's field, which was a term I was unfamiliar with until recently, um, but they are also known, uh, you might know them more as a pauper's grave or a common grave. This is a place of burial for unknown peoples. Um, sometimes they are just unmarked graves. Sometimes it is a mass grave as well. Um, if you can think of examples like, um, if somebody like a John Doe gets admitted to a hospital and ends up passing away and people don't ever discover his identity, they will typically be buried in a potter's field. And historically, um, people like Mozart is actually buried in a pauper's grave um, as well. So sometimes it's if people couldn't afford it, but it is typically for um, unknown persons. Okay, any questions about these? I do not see any questions for uh, these slides. Okay. Well, let's talk about the different types of headstones that you might come across in a cemetery then. So the types, the number of types of headstones found in cemeteries is as numerous as the type of cemeteries there are. There's all sorts of different headstones you might see uh, while you're walking around a cemetery. Field stones are some of the earliest headstones. Um, also wood was a very common uh, material to make headstones out of. However, those do not last as well as stone, so you won't see wood ones as often, but you will still regularly find um, field stone headstones. Granite is the most popular choice for headstones nowadays and is very, very long lasting which is why it is partially why it's a popular choice. Marble um, often also gets used in headstones. Um, again, in like veterans uh, cemeteries, they often use marble. It is prone to staining and weathering, however, so you do have to really make sure it is uh, kept, upkept. 
Then we have limestone and sandstone, which are both very beautiful, but do weather quite easily. Slate is also a, a choice that people will use. Um, it is more weather resistant than limestone and sandstone, but it does flake, so it's not as durable as granite. And then we have um, little different things, but still types of headstones that you can have. Uh, first, you have crypts, which are either a flat stab, some or a flat slab. Some of them are tabletop, or some are grave houses. Um, some of them, most are typically underground. You do have some that can be above ground as well, though. And then there are mausoleums. These are usually for very rich people will have a large mausoleum or for a family. You will notice them more frequently um, in areas where it is harder to bury in the ground. So um, the picture and the example on the slide is from New Orleans. Um, so coastal regions, marshy, swampy areas. Um, it's not a good idea to bury in the ground because the ground is so shifting and not good for that sort of stuff. So typically people get buried in mausoleums instead. Who did I see a question pop up in the Q&A? Uh, yes. So uh, the question was, how do you clean the black substance off of a headstone? Ah, very good question. We will talk about cleaning and I will give some resources for that later on. So hang tight, we will get there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we have different types of materials and you can definitely write names and dates on that, but many gravestones also feature symbols, arts, and epitaphs. So symbols and artwork can be used as clues about your ancestor if other parts of the headstone are no longer readable. So nowadays, we can do all sorts of things with gravestones. You can see some examples here. Obviously, this first person was very into motorcycles, or at least I would hope so, if that was going to be your uh, gravestone. Or this beautiful one in the middle, leaning on a piano, you can probably assume that they were a musician, probably a pianist. Or um, the one on the right, which is absolutely fantastic, and is a Scrabble board as his um, headstone. It gives you a lot of really good insight into who this person might have been. Uh, you can also find, I didn't include photos of these, but um, people also will do recipe gravestones. So um, they will include, like if there is a recipe that they were really well known for, they will include the recipe on their gravestone. And there's a group of people that go around the U.S. trying to collect these and then making the recipes from the different graves. So next time you're in a cemetery, you know, make sure you're reading some of these gravestones, see if somebody's left a recipe and uh, try it out. Come back, let us know. Um, so those are very, the examples on the last page were examples that are very unique to those specific people. However, there are a bunch of symbols that are used regularly and across um, the centuries that um, have different symbology and meanings behind them. And you'll see these on a lot of different tombstones. So the winged death head, which is the first photo on the left there, uh, is a symbol of mortal remains. The hourglass is uh, the flight of time. Angels on a tombstone represents God's messengers, guardians, or deliver the soul to heaven. Lambs will also uh, often represent purity, gentleness, innocence, and you can see that uh, little lamb in the middle picture there. Doves are the Holy Spirit, as seen in the photo on the right, as well as those roses and other flowers, which will can represent things like motherhood, beauty, full bloom, like a full life, or if it is just a bud, like a flower bud, it could be that this person wasn't fully bloomed, like they died young. Archways 
pillars or gates represent a passageway into the next life. Uh, a forefinger pointing up or down has a couple of different meanings. Up sometimes means that it's up meant like gone to heaven or down meant God reaching for the soul. Uh, I would hope not pointing that they went the other direction from heaven. Uh, handshakes, as uh, you can see in the middle photo there, is God's welcome to heaven. Books uh, often represent like the Bible or the book of life. Crowns and crosses uh, are faith in God and eternal life. Inver inverted torches, uh, which I don't know that I've ever actually seen, but we found this really cool example uh, in the third photo there. Uh, indicate the end of a family line. And then conch shells are more specific towards coastal states, but um, they would use those to assure rebirth into the afterlife. So yeah, you might research and see if there are any other maybe like regional things that could be included on gravestones as well. Um, if your ancestor was a member of a fraternal or sororal order, like the Masons, uh, we talked about the Odd Fellows, the Woodmen of the World, Eastern Star, the Knights of Pythias, the Elks, um, they might have some of those uh, symbology put on their gravestone. You can see the eyeball uh, on the one on the left, that is for the, the IOOF, the Odd Fellows. And then veterans will have a couple of different things that they can put on their headstone. So religious symbols is an important one. The VA has a list of approximately 65 different religious symbols that they will put onto a veteran's gravestone. So in this picture, uh, you can see there's a couple of different ones that you can tell are different. So in the very bottom left corner, that first tomb gravestone, you can see there is, that is a, um, the cup, the goblet for the um, Christian church. Behind it is just the Latin Christian cross. The one behind that, in memory of Clyde C. Morrison, you can see that cross is a little different. It is the Catholic cross. There's one a little bit to the left of that. You can see it kind of looks like a black smudge, but it's actually, uh, when you see it up close, it's the United Methodist cross. There's also ones for different, like Buddhism or Judaism. 65 different religious symbols that they will put on there. And sometimes they will have, um, perhaps if the person wasn't buried at the veteran cemetery, um, you will have a some sort of symbol uh, denoting what branch of service they served if it's not um, written out on the gravestone. Any questions about symbology, gravestones, types of cemeteries before we move on? Uh, no, nope, no questions. Awesome. Okay, now you know what kind of things you should look for, how to research where your ancestor might be. You figured all of this out. You're ready to go out there and take a look at the cemetery for yourself. So let's talk about what you need to do to plan your trip. Early spring, is the best time to go to the cemeteries and walk around, especially here in Texas when, uh, oh, it didn't even, it was in the 90s today, but when it's been 105 for the past several months, you don't really wanna be outside walking around. So early spring is probably the best time to go, but make sure um, you were watching out for bugs and snakes. Uh, one of the best ways to do that is to dress accordingly, wear protective clothing, long sleeves, closed-toed shoes. You don't know what might be lurking around or anything like that, so just make sure you're protected. Watch your step when you're walking around. You can watch potholes, uneven grounds, headstones that maybe have been broken and are like lying under some tall grass. You just want to be very cautious as you're walking. You don't want to get hurt. When you're there, please take pictures. It is encouraged a lot of the time. Um, but don't just take pictures of the gravestones that you're looking uh, at. Take pictures of the surrounding area, the entrance to the cemetery, 
um, nearby headstones, maybe which way you took to get to your ancestor's grave. Or take notes about all of these too. Just don't rely on your pictures or your memory because uh, things also might change if you come back several years later. Uh, just like more graves around landmarks, maybe a tree got cut down. So um, describe the symbols on the tombstones if there are any. Where is the tombstone located from the entrance? Um, what type of cemetery is it? Is it a memorial park? Is it a graveyard? Um, the location of the cemetery, the location of the grave, other, uh, are the graves oriented north-south or are they oriented east-west? Is the marker made of granite? What, what material is it made out of? Are there other hints of like religion or epi uh, epidemics like if they died during the 1918 Spanish flu outbreak? Um, like, did they die in 1918? You might maybe find a clue from that. Um, if you can, try to acquire a map or a transcription, like if they already had, like we saw that young cemetery map, if they have something like that, um, that has everything already listed out, that would be very handy, but if not just a general map, so you can make your own notations as to where your ancestors' graves might be, again, which directions you took to get to that grave. Um, just jot all the information down that you can. Um, mistakes are going to be made. Um, this is, could be on the part of the cemetery or the stone cutter. The back in the day, um, well, even now, headstones can be very expensive and mistakes can be made and it's expensive to correct. So sometimes the headstone will just have incorrect, maybe it might be a misspelling, a date might be uh, transposed a little bit or like a day off. Hopefully all that would be correct, but just beware. If things are a little bit off, you just might have to find more research and context clues to verify that that is your ancestor. While you're there, survey the whole cemetery. Map it out if you can't find a map. Um, people in this cemetery are more likely to be friends and family, because often they would like to be buried together. Um, so if you have one ancestor in the cemetery, the likelihood that you're going to have more is often high. Um, and their names are going to appear in other documents as you research. So um, that can give you, you might find clues about if it's an uncle of your ancestor, well, that could still give parents birthplace and that's the, the same ancestor that you would be looking for. So think about those sort of things when you're in the cemetery. Um, be respectful. So as a resting place. Um, you don't want to step on gravestones. You're not trying to bring music and, you know, goof off and all of that. Still be respectful. But you can bring a friend. It's always more fun to walk around and explore. And sometimes you need a, a second hand looking for things or trying to make transcriptions and stuff like that. So what can you bring with you? The basic thing that I always recommend to bring for any any genealogical research you're going to be doing are notebook, pens, and pencils. You want to be able to document all the information that you find about your ancestors. Um, other supplies are going to include, if you decide you want to do tombstone rubbings, which we will talk about in a minute, um, you can bring rubbing wax or jumbo crayons, scissors, masking tape, or this is why you bring a friend with you to help you hold um, the, the, I was gonna say paper, it's not paper, we're gonna talk about that next, the um, interfacing while um, you're doing the rubbing. Uh, yeah, and when you don't actually, when you're doing these tombstone wrappings, they don't do on paper, it is actually recommended to use a non-fusible medium to heavy weight interfacing. So if any of you, uh, watching do sewing, you know what interfacing is. You can find it at craft stores. Um, for you, I would bring an apron with many pockets, especially if you're gonna be doing some cleaning of gravestones. You don't wanna get your outfit all gross and icky and you wanna have all of your tools easily accessible on you. So an apron is really handy um, because many of these gravestones are lower. Some gardener's knee pads, 
some gloves are always a great thing. As, again, if you're going to be brushing things, using water, soaps, you don't want to get your hands all um, damaged or dirty. So we can use gloves. Or in just general, if you're walking around, sunscreen, bug repellent, wet wipes, different things like that are going to help keep you comfortable while you're out there. For cleaning, um, bring a paintbrush, possibly a whisk broom. It is very important, though, no wire. We don't want to bring anything that, if you're using this on the headstones, is going to mar them or damage them in any sort of way. Um, we are really concerned about the preservation of these stones. And like we were talking about earlier, some of them are either very old or like the limestone or sandstone ones can be more easily eroded. So anything you can do to avoid um, damaging them is going to be preferred. You can also bring a spray bottle with water, preferably distilled. Again, having a neutral pH, you're not going to like spraying acid or something with an acidic pH onto these tombstones. We're just trying to keep it as neutral as possible, but sometimes you do need a little water to help clean and break it up. And then some rags as well. So um, if you are going to come out there and take photographs or tombstone rubbings, we have a couple of different suggestions for you. First and foremost, like we said, preservation is the most important. If the gravestone is crumbling, don't do anything. Uh, you can take photos, but I wouldn't try to clean it. I wouldn't try to do a rubbing on it. We preserve it, at least your photo, you have a um, record of it that way. If you do decide um, that doing some cleaning or some tombstone rubbings is something that you're interested in, uh, you can check with your the sexton or the caretaker of the graveyard before you do anything. Uh, it may be prohibited. They may have people that do it already. So I'd always check with them first. But if they say it's okay, you can always clean the stone with water. We don't want to use any um, solvents or things like that. Use your brush, your not wire brush, to loosen any debris and then wipe it all away with the rag. Uh, when you're photographing, make sure to avoid shadows. You don't want to be like um, this photo right here where you can kind of read it, but it's hard and you can't see all the details because of the shadows. So, you know, just move to the side a little, lean a little back, wait till a different time of day so you don't have to cast shadows on that tombstone. Or if you want a mirror or um, if you do photography, they have like fill bounces. You can use those to illuminate the stone and help eliminate some of those shadows. Um, if you're going to do a rubbing, this is an example on the right of uh, a rubbing somebody did of a tombstone. Um, you are going to use interfacing, like we said, not paper, because it doesn't tear and it can easily be folded. You will wrap it around the tombstone by either taping it to the backside or having your partner hold it. And then you will take your wax or your crayon and just rub it over the fabric. Um, many of you, you might be familiar with this at the National Vietnam Memorial in Washington, DC. That's one of the places where people actually come and do rubbings, but they do it with paper and pencil. For that, I would think it's okay, but uh, typically for other um, rubbings, this is the method we would say to do it in. And then once you get home, you can set the wax into the fabric by ironing it. Just give it that little bit of heat, melt it, and it will um, go into the interfacing and the fusing. Um, if you are interested in helping with some of these cemetery projects and preservations, or you want to um, yeah, help clean gravestones, different things like that, you can absolutely volunteer for some of the resources we discussed earlier. Um, like we were talking about the, um, which one, the US Gen Web had the cemetery projects, the gravestone photographic resource, uh, you can take photos and add things there. The US Gen Web Tombstone Transcription Project, you can help transcribe, or if you find a cemetery that hasn't been indexed yet, you can be the one that goes out, takes the photos of them, indexes it, and maps it. 
Um, if you're going to do that, please make sure you proofread. Like I said earlier, mistakes can be made, but if we try and keep it as accurate as possible, it's going to be able to help the most people possible. Um, find a grave as well. Oh, I didn't mention that one. They often find a grave is often filled out by volunteers who walk the cemeteries and index and just transcribe every grave in that cemetery. So that's something you're interested in. You can absolutely do it. You can also become a member of a preservation association. Um, there are people out there who this is what they go and do in their spare time. Um, so if you're really interested, you can really dive into it or make it a family affair. These are all of your ancestors. So you can bring, do a family reunion, go clean your old ancestors' um, headstones. If you do want to learn more, um, so whoever asked that question earlier about um, cleaning their gravestone, the National Park Service has the Cemetery Preservation Foundation. Online, they also have a course about um, preserving gravestones. So that'll include a lot of the cleaning as well. And it has information, yeah, understanding the methods and practices of preserving graveyards. So um, we can find that link and put it in the chat later on um, once we finish the present presentation, but I highly recommend that. They had some really, really great information. Um, there are a bunch of organizations. Again, if you're wanting to learn more about the different gravestones or cemeteries in the area, how you can clean them, how you can become a part of um, transcribing or indexing, or just maybe seeing if people in the area have done some of this already. Um, locally, we do have the Plano Conservancy and the Collin County Historical Commission that do a lot of stuff with graveyards and cemeteries. Um, the Texas Historical Commission is the statewide organization that has some cemetery preservation as well. On Facebook, there are groups like Plano History and Nostalgia, Plano Old City Cemetery Friends, Traces of Texas, and Texas Cemetery History. So if you know your ancestor was either buried here in Plano or Collin County, or maybe just somewhere in Texas, they might have some information um, if you're not finding things on just like if you're Googling and not finding them. And then some of those national organizations that we've talked about as well. You can always contribute to them or reach out to them if you are looking for um, some assistance or um, just to see what's out there. Any questions about this, about cleaning, about rubbings, about joining different groups? Uh, no, no questions. No? Okay. So we're almost to the end but we're gonna talk about some other fun little tidbits as uh, funeral customs go back really, really far. Um, so there's all sorts of customs, myths, and superstitions that go around funerals and burials. So for example, the Puritans had little regard to physical remains, but privately grieved. Uh, they publicly showed no expressions Death was just a part of their daily life and prayer. Some religions will use bell ringing to either frighten away evil spirits, to toll the age of the deceased and spread word of the death. Before undertakers, uh, which kind of was in that like 1850s to like 1920s era, family or neighbors would often prepare the body. Um, one of the things, a custom or a myth that they liked to do before rigor mortis set in would be tie a cord or handkerchief around the head and chin to keep the mouth from dropping open. Or bodies were arranged with arms across the chest, coins on the eyelid or burial tire, uh, some, anything from a shroud to the deceased's best clothes. Um, let's see what else. And before we had embalming, often the dead were buried within 24 hours in summer, but most uh, were within three or four days. Embalming didn't begin uh, until the Civil War uh, to transport bodies from the battlefield back to their home grave sites. And then by the 1920s, almost all corpses were voluntarily 
done with the big theatrical makeup and regular clothing to make them look more natural. That is not actually required by law. You don't have to um, undergo embalming when you pass away. Uh, wood coffins were made quickly. Sawdust and wood shavings were put in the coffin because superstition held that if you, um, not because, sorry. So they would put sawdust and wood shavings into the coffin and superstition held that if you tracked that into the house, someone else was going to die as well. So you were very superstitious about that. Um, oftentimes, there was no special lining. The uh, deceased would be just wrapped in a sheet or a quilt unless someone made a quilt specifically for the burial. Um, in the diaries that we have here in the archives, Lizzie Carpenter mentioned that she made a few um, burial quilts in her diaries. Um, wakes um, were both practical and social. Um, before like a real, real funeral. Often it would keep the bugs and animals and body snatchers um, away and to ensure the person was actually dead that they weren't uh, prematurely buried. Most festive wakes are in the homes of the Irish, but others also had lavish wakes with food and liquor, uh, make it more a celebration of life than of death. Um, before the 1900s, funerals were invitation only, and it was very rude to not attend, uh, and food and drinks would often be served. In the 1900s, with newspaper obituaries and telephoning uh, becoming, becoming a popular way of communicating, uh, it wasn't really needed to send an invitation. Um, and then the odor of decompo decomposing bodies first led to, that's why we have flower arrangements at funerals. Let's see, the first crematorium in America didn't exist until 1884 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and cremation was not a popular form of burial in America until the late 19th century. So if you're looking for ancestors that are before that, you can assume that that is not typically how they are, um, would have been, like not buried, but um, how their remains would have been taken care of. Um, when people are in mourning, there are different uh, customs that we do, like having a funeral funeral wreath or covering a doorbell or no knocker with dark crepe paper, covering mirrors or shades at dawn, having clocks stopped at the hour of the death. These are all um, customs and superstitions that go back. Wearing black after death was more popular in America in the mid 1800s when that really started becoming a thing. Uh, in like most etiquette rules for women. And funeral gifts used to be given to the living. Stationary for the first year by, that was used by the widow had to have a one inch black border if you were keeping up with etiquette. Okay, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. I find this so fascinating. Post-mortem photographs. So this photo on the right is actually one that we have in the archives here in Collin County. I scanned it and included it for, in our presentation. Uh, this is one of the, if you're familiar with like the Carpenter family of the Carpenter Rec Center or Carpenter Middle School. Um, this is one of the Carpenters. Um, we also have his portrait just painting um, hanging in the genealogy center if you want to come and see him. But um, this is his post-mortem photograph post-mortem photographed. Um, it was a custom or a tradition sometimes to have photographs taken with the deceased or of the deceased. It started in about the 1840s. Uh, people still do do this sometimes today. It's just not broadcast as much because we think it's a little morbid or weird. It did start because back when photography was starting out, it was very expensive to get your photo taken and you had to sit extremely still. So who sits stiller than the dead? Nobody. And because it's so expensive, uh, especially if like you had a child who died young and this might be the only opportunity you get to have a photograph of them, you would photograph them um, after they had died. So they're also called memento mori. You can go and they have lots of really interesting, you can find so many interesting ones online. Um, Body snatching, oh, excuse me, is unfortunately a phenomenon that also happened often. Um, 
especially close to American medical schools. Um, medical schools today need about 300 to 900 bodies a year. So you can imagine how many uh, they were using um, previously. Schools would hire professional body snatchers who charged anywhere from $5 to $30 for cadavers that they could use in their lessons. There were even arrangements with some undertakers before the body was buried to have it taken away. So people would hire body watchers to sit with the body until it was decomposed sufficiently. Uh, or sometimes if the dead was a criminal or an unclaimed body or died in a poorhouse, instead of being buried in one of the potter's fields, they might have been sent to the medical schools as well. So it was a really prevalent problem for a while until the late 1890s when laws were passed to be able to provide bodies to the schools, like you can donate your body to science. Um, that helped curb a lot of that. Uh, people did... Also, of course, there were always people who robbed graves for jewelry or different things like that. Uh, it's suggested that if you want to try and discover if your ancestor's body might be missing, you can read the newspaper several days after the death because the newspapers would often mention names of deceased who had gone missing. That's a fun thing. You don't know, you could go back and read a newspaper and find out about body snatching. Um, premature burials. So prior to the 1880s, um, sometimes people were believed to be dead and weren't actually. So the first life-saving co coffin was patented in 1843. The occupant could release a spring lid, but if they were already buried, it wouldn't activate. They still had to be um, above ground for that feature to actually work. So then they started doing things like um, doing bells and alarms that could be activated to allow people above ground to hear them. So there would be a, like a bell on the tombstone and a string that would go down and be in the coffin as well. So if you woke up and you were in a coffin, you could ring the bell and they would come unbury you. Uh, this continued until the 1880s and then embalming really kind of took that fear away from people. And then other types of burials. Now today we do, there's a lot of different ways that you um, can be buried or uh, things to be done with your remains. Again, we talked about creation, cremation being a newer um, way that people want their remains to be taken care of. You can also do eco-friendly green funerals that don't have embalming or caskets as much. You can be buried under the roots of a tree there's, uh, you can be cremated and then your ashes can be um, compressed into a diamond. So it's like lots have changed since we started doing all of these funeral customs, but there's something for everybody out there. Uh, any questions before we move into the very end? Uh, yes, there is a question. Um, are there any notations or markings on headstones that would indicate a family plot, even though not all of the family members are buried there are listed? Um, possibly. Sometimes if in a family plot, you can see like there might be one single like memorial or marker that's maybe bigger than all the rest that has like the family's last name but then they would still have individual headstones for the other people that are buried there. Um, you might be able, if it's a public cemetery, you could ask whoever the caretakers are, like if all of the plots in that area have been sold, um, if there's ones maybe that, or maybe in a different part of the cemetery, if they're not listed all right there, um, or you might just have to look around. Does that kind of answer the question or do you need more clarification still? Uh, I don't see any follow-ups to it right now. Okay. Do you have any follow-ups? If that didn't answer it enough, put it back in the chat. Um, I'll be glad to try and answer that better. Otherwise, so if you're looking for more resources, a lot of the information from this class um, were from these two books. We have Your Guide to Cemetery Research. 
by Sharon de Bartolo Carmack and the Family Tree Cemetery Field Guide, How to Find, Record, and Preserve Your Ancestors' Graves by Joy Neighbors. And we have both of these in the library. Um, if they're in the Genealogy Center, unfortunately, they have to stay in the Genealogy Center. You can't check them out, but you're welcome to come here, um, take photos, make photocopies if there's like a specific section that you uh, wanted more information on. And if there, you have any further questions, you come back later tonight and you think of something else you wanted to ask, you can always give us an email, genealogy at plano.gov. We'll email our entire genealogy team. And typically somebody will get back to you within 24 or 48 hours. Um, if you want help with your research, you can also submit a book, a genealogy librarian request where we can try and help you get any over any brick walls you might have, um, get you started in your research, show you some of the resources that we have in a little one-on-one -on -one session. Um, otherwise, I'll be around for a few more minutes to answer any more questions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we will have a lot more genealogy programs coming up in the fall, including the annual genealogy lock-in in October. So make sure that you check out um, the new Engage brochure, which is, uh, should be at all Plano, location, Plano Public Library locations and on the website now. Um, and thank you so much for attending. We hope to see you in the future. Okay. Any other questions? We had some more things come through. Uh, there was a question about, um, can people be emailed uh, the slide presentation of this program? Um, you can always email the genealogy at plano.gov if you really wanted a copy of this. I believe the notes from this are posted on the Genealogy Center page. Um, and then, like I said, at the beginning of the class, the recording will be put on our YouTube later if you wanted to rewatch it. Um, but yeah, if you really want the slide deck, give us an email and we can see what we can do. Anything else? Uh, I did answer a question. Um, someone asked if you needed to be a Collin County resident to attend our programs, um, and you do not. You can sign up you for uh, any uh, Zoom class that you would like. Yes, we've had people from all across the United States come and attend these programs virtually. So yeah, if you have family, friends that live in anywhere, I'm just going to say Washington, D.C., New York City, L.A., Europe, Asia, everybody is free to join. We want to help everybody try and find their ancestors. Let's see, one more just pop up. Oh, awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for attending. We really do appreciate having you all here. All right, I'll give it a couple more minutes. If you can think of any other questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we will end the Zoom shortly. Ah. Uh, this one was not a question, um, but someone mentioned that the National Museum of Funeral History in North Houston is interesting. Yes, my friend actually used to live down the street from that, and I have never actually been, but now I really want to go. Thank you for mentioning that. All right, that looks like that is all the questions we have. Thank you so much for attending, and we will see you next time.